Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. My wife takes specific education classes, but is it that good there? We'll find out in today's story. Enjoy the story! When you're having the best day of your life and you think it is, you need to know it can only get worse. I used to think the best day of my life was the day I married Janet Brown, now Mrs. Bobby Thomas. She was 24 years old and a new teacher at the elementary school in Mon, Georgia, where my older sister also taught. Janet was cute, and my sister just had to set us up. I was 27, fresh out of the University of Georgia Law School, and a new paralegal at the firm of Bingham Carlton and Quick. In the first year of work, I earned $40,000. It took Janet and me a year to get married. At first, we met from time to time, afterwards, she said that she fell in love with me from the first time we met at a party my sister threw for new teachers and others. I was one of the others. Most of the others were representatives of local community organizations, so my sister introduced new teachers to the social life of Mon. I grew up here and knew almost everyone, obviously. I didn't need that kind of dating, but Frankie, my sister, thought I needed to meet the right girls. Janet grew up in southern Georgia, attended UG on a partial scholarship, and was excited to move to Mon to begin her teaching career, and I was glad to introduce her to Mon. As our dates got longer, we went from kissing a little to a lot, as usual, to Bobby, honey, I'm sorry, but I'm just uncomfortable. I mean, I like it and all, but it will lead to more, and then you know, to even more. And, I've got to tell you, when I get married, I'll be one of those girls who walks down the aisle clean and an immaculate ideal bride for her husband. Wow, I replied, you must have rehearsed this at least several times and maybe used it on a few guys. I wasn't really trying to insult her, but that's exactly what she thought. We were in my apartment, and she jumped up, said something about my bad intentions, and left. I sat waiting for her to return. I picked her up from her apartment, which she shared with two other girls, and we went out to dinner. I wondered how she was going to get home. I later learned from my sister, Frankie, of course, that Janet had called her. Frankie picked her up, and they went to drink coffee and chat with the girls. The next morning, Frankie called me to calm my feelings, as only a sister can, that Janet was worried about me. Very worried, but she was completely inexperienced, and under no circumstances should I rush with her. Hello, Janet, I answered the phone the next day. Janet, it's me, Bobby. I'm calling to apologize for my comment last night. You were honest with me, but I said it without thinking about how important your words are. You mean a lot to me, and I hope you forgive me. I didn't really care much about untouchable or purity or anything like that, but I really liked Janet and thought we could have a future together, and we really did, a joint future. I mean, six months later, she walked down the aisle in a small church in South Georgia, and we were married in a very traditional ceremony. She did indeed turn out to be pure, but we made amends for that on the first night of our honeymoon at the Amelia Island Resort. Intim with Janet became enjoyable but was a little difficult at first. She was untouchable that first night, blood and all, and intercourse was not comfortable for her, and I admit that I made things even worse. By that time, I had not had a night for a long time, and after I penetrated her, my constant stroking, which did not last long that first night, irritated her even more. She cried, and I tried to console her, promising that everything would work out. She said that she knew about this, her mother warned her. We finally fell asleep and were cuddling with each other, so that was a good sign. The next morning, Janet surprised me. Although she was untouchable, she acquired some other skills in dealing with the men she dated. She woke me up with pleasure below the belt, which remained the best in my life, and mind you, no hands, she said. When I had recovered enough to look at her, impressive. That morning, we went to the beach and returned to our room and took a shower together. I promised her that there would be no more pain and that perhaps she would enjoy it. When we returned to bed, we kissed a little, and I moved lower to enjoy her chest. I think she might be content with just playing with her chest, but I had other plans. I moved further down, and she grabbed my head as if wanting to stop me. It's okay, I said, it doesn't hurt. What do you, oh, no, no, I don't want to, she began. As soon as I reached her bud, at that moment, I had never seen her up close, and I liked what I saw. Everything she tried to say turned into a noise. 
Janet went into the bathroom to clean herself up a bit, and I lay there feeling quite pleased with myself. No one has ever done this to me before, she said. It was much better than last night. We need to work on both, I replied. Night can be better if we do it right. Last night was our first, so we need a lot of practice to get it right. Last night was painful for you, we'll wait another day or so and try again. I'll take it very slowly and guarantee it will be much, much better. And so it was. We were both patient, and the intim really got better. Bobby, you know I love you, but when we got married, I didn't know how much I could love you. You make me glow from within, you make me enjoy life, she said, crying. Hey, hey, calm down. I don't think I'll cry, but you know that I love you too, and I like having night with you. Over the years, we always went to bed together, even on the nights when we didn't have anything. Even on the nights when I was overwhelmed with work at the law firm, or Janet was overwhelmed with papers to grade or lesson plans to prepare for. Sometimes one of us would get up in the middle of the night or early in the morning to do paperwork, but going to bed together was a non-negotiable condition for us. This meant that we cuddled every night, had intim often, and remained connected to each other until lustful cockroaches settled in her head. We had been married for less than six years when I had what I considered the best day of my life. Not many flights fly into the small Mackin airport, although the huge Atlanta airport is only 90 minutes away in Nashville. I dealt with a retired hardware store owner in Mon. He wanted to make sure that ownership would pass solely to one of his children. We worked things out. He signed a few papers and was happy, and I was happy to find a direct flight from Nashville to Mon. On this flight, I met the man who made the best day of my life possible. John Thompson is a shopping center developer in Nashville. His niche is small towns that he believes are underserved in terms of retail opportunities but have great potential for growth. He identified Mon as one of those cities and flew there to look at possible locations for shopping centers. At the time, I was a senior associate in my law firm, but the partnership was still a few years away. It so happened that I sat next to John and spent the entire flight pitching my law firm as the best in Mon and myself as the best lawyer for shopping mall development deals. Truth be told, I'd never done a deal like this in my life, but you know, fake it till you make it, so I did. John was impressed, either by the skills I was presenting or maybe just by my bravado. Anyway, he hired me. More precisely, he hired my law firm. Over the next two years, we identified the best site, formed a new LLC for John to acquire the site, negotiated with potential investors, negotiated capital and debt. Deals to finance the project, negotiated pre-lease agreements for leading retailers, and on and on, things like that. The deal took on a life of its own, and since John was mostly in Nashville or somewhere else, that life became more and more dependent on me. I liked it. I admit that all this work has affected my personal life. I have less time for my relationship with Janet, especially for those moments that mean nothing in the moment but are overall meaningful. Sitting on the couch in each other's arms and watching a stupid movie, going for ice cream at Dairy Queen, those moments that strengthen and cement relationships. I managed to maintain our commitment to always going to bed together, and I think that was incredibly important for us. But often I would get up at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning to work on spreadsheets or contract issues or any other pressing issue. Finally, on Thursday morning, we closed a large loan, and my firm received the largest fee in its history. Jack Carlton, the firm's managing partner, called me into his office, where he and two other partners opened a bottle of champagne. He handed me the glass. Bobby, when you started working with John Thompson two years ago, we, pointing to his partners, had some concerns that you were not suitable for the job. Too young, not experienced enough, not serious enough, if you know what I mean. I was silent. He wouldn't have handed me a glass of champagne if the news had been bad. But you did a damn good job, maybe better than any of us could have done, he pointed to his partners again. You gave your all to this project, impressed everyone you worked with, and frankly made us a ton of money. A few minutes ago, before opening the champagne, we held a quick meeting of partners and voted on two things. First, an immediate bonus of $100,000 as compensation for what you did, and secondly, for offering to join us as a partner from the date of the contract. In recognition of the kind of lawyer you have become and the kind of lawyer we want to work with for decades to come. I confess I didn't expect either one, 
That is, I knew that they would give me a big bonus, but $100,000, and more importantly, a partnership. I stood there stunned. Bobby, have some champagne and say something, Mr. Cassette with a smile. I think they all realized that I was overwhelmed. Mr. Quick, I, no, 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 he interrupted me, as partners, we all call each other by name here. I'm Charles, Carlton is Jack, and Bingham, well, he's so old that maybe you should call him Mr. They all laughed, and Bingham jumped up. Bobby, call me Fred here, but when you pay me on the golf course after I've whipped your young fifth place, you can call me whatever you want. More laughter, and I finally drank some champagne. True, I was still in shock. You don't work until the end of today, Bobby. Go and tell your beautiful wife this good news. I know you have some business to finalize on the mall deal, but the condition of the partnership is that you take a week off and recover a little from all the work you've been doing. Take your wife on a cruise or something, Jack, the former Mr. Carlton, asked. Yes, sir, I replied, as I finally realized that I was sane again. And gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for the trust you have placed in me over the past few years. For the impressive bonus, and most importantly, for the honor of being accepted into partnership. This is the most magnificent achievement of my life. We all shook hands, finished off the champagne, chatted some more, and I headed home to share with Janet. As I already said, it was the best day of my life. When I arrived, Janet was already at home. The next day, Friday, was the last day of school. And they worked half a day on Thursday and Friday to give teachers time to finish grading and preparing report cards. Janet was busy working at the kitchen table when I walked in. Honey, I have great news, I began, taking off my coat and tie. Bobby, I'm almost done, and I also have news that I want to share with you. Just let me finish up with the last report cards, and we can talk, she said. I didn't raise the issue and looked at possible cruises departing next week on our home computer. The Caribbean would probably be the best option, but there are many, many options to work through. It's hard work, you know, but somebody has to do it. A little later, Janet popped into my home office with a glass of wine and an expression of some concern on her face. Honey, you look like something happened. Is it because of your news? She asked. Well, she began, but I interrupted her. You're not sick, are you? What happened? I started in my typical lawyer problem-solving mode. No, no, I'm not sick. I just wanted to tell you about my schedule for next week. School is over, as you know, and I have signed up for courses that I will take from 10 to 2 every day next Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, she explained. Oh, well, I didn't know what to say. This was the first time I had heard about the course. Already dreaming of nights in the Caribbean for the next week. Could you change the time? I asked. No, she interrupted me. James, the teacher, has already squeezed me in, and I've already paid in advance. Wow, okay. What kind of courses are these? Are they here in the city? I inquired. Yes, here. Classes are held at his house, at James's house on Laramie Drive, she replied. Okay, what does he teach that the courses are held in his house? I questioned. Bobby, listen, listen, okay? This is an education course. James teaches techniques that will improve my intimate performance. It will actually be good for me and good for us. I mean, you and me too, she said excitedly. Wait, what? This technique's in his house? You, my mind didn't understand what she was saying. She couldn't mean what I imagined, could she? Janet, how many students will there be, all women or men too? I asked, feeling a knot forming in my stomach. Well, you know, on the first day, it will be just him and me, and then, then he says he can invite an assistant on the second day, and maybe someone else on the last day. He calls it the grand finale, Bobby. This could be very good for us, she explained enthusiastically. Yes, yes. You already said that, I interjected, feeling a mix of confusion and disbelief. I want to ask, does this course mean that you will have a night with this guy? Oh, God, I suddenly realized her words, and with his assistant too. Yes, of course. 
James says practice is the only way to get better, and different experiences with different people make for better practice, honey. A few weeks ago, one of my high school friends took this course during spring break. She says she had a great time and learned a lot. She said James rated her improvement from a baseline 80th percentile to the 90th percentile in overall intimate activity, and my base is already 90th percentile. So I have a chance to score very high, she explained, her eyes shining with anticipation. Janet, are you crazy? I can't believe what you're saying. Your base, how does James know about your level of your activity? You're not, I froze. I couldn't bring myself to ask if she had a night with this man. If so, our marriage is over. She should know this, almost six years ago we made a vow to each other in her church and have kept that promise every night since. James says it's important for him to know my baseline so he can tailor the sessions to me for the best results, she replied, seemingly oblivious to my inner turmoil. I stared at her silently. This is not my wife speaking. I should have asked, Janet, have, have you already had intimate with James? No, that would be treason. I should only have a part of the course, you know, this is just education, she replied confidently. Then how does James know what your baseline level of intimate activity is? I demanded, my voice rising with frustration. Well, I gave him pleasure below the belt. I thought it was quick, but he said it was really great, and then he spent a few minutes assessing my reaction to stimulation. Really, Bobby, it was just to prepare for class. Lustful cockroaches. I thought my wife is amazed by lustful cockroaches and now it is controlled by some non-existent being who has no idea about our obligations to each other. Okay, okay, I know this all sounds like crap, but still, wait, wait, Janet, you said James would have several assistants for the grand finale. What does it mean, several partners at the same time? Oh, I don't know. It depends on how I spend the first two days of classes, Janet replied. James said my high baseline meant I could do well. And, Bobby, my high baseline must be due to the intimu and I have been having since we got married. We should be proud that my result is so high without any special preparation. James says, Janet, listen to me, please. First of all, I don't want to hear that name anymore. He is destroying our marriage. Well, actually, you're ruining our marriage. I asked you when we first started talking if you were sure, you said no, but I think you must be sick. I mean, Janet, my wife, the woman I've loved for over six years, can't plan to have intimate next week with multiple men, can't talk with a calm face about what she's already done with another man. Janet, now you're asking for a divorce, you know this, right? Bobby, listen to me, okay? James, okay, okay, uh, I won't say his name anymore. The teacher said that you might react like that and suggested that I not even tell you about this course. But you and I have always been honest and open with each other, so I decided it was better to share with you. Look at this course like one of your legal education courses, except this education, and I think I'll learn a lot more practical things than you learn in your law courses, she explained. I looked at her like she was crazy. Lustful cockroaches, I thought again. I mean, how can a wife, how can my Janet, how can she, oh, damn, one more thought. Janet, you said that you already paid the deposit? Yes, $500, and the balance of $400 is due on the first day of classes. James, I mean, he said he was giving me a $100 discount because my high baseline might give him the pleasure of teaching me, she explained. I just wanted to take the gun and shoot her, put her out of her misery. No one will put me in jail for shooting her after this conversation. Janet, please listen, I'm serious, heart attack, if you agree to this, I'll file for divorce next week. Considering what you've already done, we might end up getting a divorce, but I have to think about it. If we have any chance of surviving as a married couple, I will definitely go to counseling. Do you hear what I'm saying? Bobby, I can hear you, but I don't think you can hear me. This doesn't mean I'm going to go out and cheat with some guy I pick up at a bar. I would never do that. This is education. I believe in education. I believe in its importance and the ability of a good education to make our lives better. I think you believe it too. I admit that this kind of education is not generally accepted, but it will be good for me and for us. You have to trust me on this, okay? Janet, 
I give up. Remember what I said about divorce? I'm going for a run, I replied. Bobby, what about your news? You said you had news you wanted to share. Janet, my news is completely insignificant compared to yours, I said as I went into our bedroom to change into my running clothes. And also moved some of my things into the guest room. My run got off to a terrible start. My mind was too distracted by my conversation with Janet to allow me to relax during the run. But after a few miles, I felt the stress go away. Running may be the best therapy for me, and this run was definitely good therapy. I worked so hard that I neglected running, and within a few miles, I felt the results of that neglect. I headed home, or what was my home, I wasn't sure. When I returned, Janet was in bed, which was good because I had absolutely no desire to talk to her. I quickly showered and went to bed in the guest room. The next morning, I got up early and left the house before Janet got up. When I got to the office, I saw that Jack Carlton had already arrived. Mr. Carlton, ah, uh, Jack, sorry, Jack, do you have a minute? Of course, Bobby. What's the matter? I thought you would oversleep this morning. Sir, I have a real problem at home, and I need help, I said, and I told him Janet's short version of the news. My God, what a story. I like the term lustful cockroaches. I've never heard it, and now I'll have to add it to my vocabulary. Okay, first things first, find a good family lawyer. I don't want to call her a divorce lawyer just yet, but she definitely is Elizabeth Jenkins. Don't call her Beth or Liz or anything else, just Elizabeth. She is a very formal person, and I think the best divorce lawyer in Mon. Oops, I'm already talking about divorce, Bobby. I hope it doesn't come to that, but I'll understand if it does. When I dated Janet, she seemed like a wonderful person with a good head on her shoulders, reliable, from South Georgia, right? Yes, sir, and I agree, it's just so weird. I asked her if she was sick, but she said no. Well, if she has some kind of mental illness, she won't necessarily admit it. I think she's crazy, but I also think it's an insult to people with real mental illnesses to blame it on a mental health problem. I'm afraid I think she just wants intimate with someone else, and this is her way of justifying it. Maybe. Anyway, the second thing we need to do is cancel your bonus. You don't want to look worse than you feel. I'm just canceling it for now. If you get divorced, it will be better if you don't have to share her with your then ex-wife. When all this smoke clears, you'll still get that bonus. And in the same way, we are ruling out partnership for now. But between you and me, both of these things, the bonus and the partnership, are yours. And since we, the current partners, I mean, have not yet made anything official, I can, if it comes to that, testify that you are not entitled to either a bonus or admission to the partnership. Logical. Wow, yes, that makes sense. It's just hard for me to come to terms with this. I mean, 24 hours ago, I was on top of the world, and Janet and I were an inseparable team. And now she's gone crazy, and I'm plotting something separate from her, I expressed. Just, Bobby, stop, listen to me. You need to leave the office. I know that you are a runner and love to exercise. Go and do this, and then come back and visit me. I'll call Elizabeth Jenkins and make an appointment for you today. Logical? Yes, thank you. That makes sense, and thanks for the help, I acknowledged. Hey, that's what partners are for, he reassured. I headed towards the exit but not before stopping by the break room to get some coffee. I was sitting there, just staring at the wall, not even drinking my coffee, when our secretary walked in, Christy Mack, something I couldn't remember her last name. I took my coffee and headed out, but then stopped. Mr. Thomas, are you okay? You look sick or something, she asked. Um, thank you, Christy. I'm, uh, I'm, you know, just sitting here, I replied. Well, maybe you should go home. I know you made a big deal yesterday. Everyone in the company talks about it. You should go celebrate or something. You shouldn't just sit here, she suggested. Yes, thank you, Christy. I will. Not bother you, I replied. I stood up and headed towards the exit just as she said, Sorry, don't bother me. It didn't mean anything. 
I actually went out for a second run, short and not at all satisfactory. Back at our office building, which has a gym and showers, I worked out some more until it was time to go see Elizabeth. I showered and arrived at her office in time to make it to my 4 p.m. meeting. Bobby, I'm sure it's okay to call you Bobby, she began. Right after all, Jack Carlton said you were his friend, which means you were my friend. He said a lot of good things about you, but he also said that your wife was struck by lusty cockroaches. She put air quotes around the term, and we both laughed a little. God, it's good that I can laugh. Yes, that's what I told him, I replied. And I told the story again. Elizabeth listened, took notes, made sympathetic sounds, and did not interrupt my sad story. I ended up like this, to tell the truth. She seemed to have gone crazy. Her insistence on having intimate with multiple men in the next week goes against everything she and I have believed since we met almost seven years ago. I'm almost at my limit just trying to comprehend this. Okay, that's why I'm here. To help you understand and make some plans to deal with her plans. She plans to start this education course on Monday, right? Elizabeth asked, air quoting again, but this time without laughter. Right. So, you have the weekend for her to change her mind? I responded. Yes, but wait, listen, let me finish. I think you should give her a chance. I also think I should prepare a divorce petition to file on Monday afternoon if she continues this idiocy. If she does back down, I recommend you both get some serious marriage counseling if, and I know this is a big if, you want to try to stay with her. I can prepare a fairly standard divorce petition this afternoon. Financial issues will be determined later. If necessary, we can hire a private investigator to follow her on Monday, or you can do it. If you decide to do this, you must assure me that you will not do anything that could jeopardize your law license or land you in jail. If she agrees to this, I can ask to be served in a house where adultery occurs, which is exactly what it is. If we are lucky, the course may be interrupted, Elizabeth explained, air quoting again. And one more idea, she paid James a $500 deposit. We can argue that this payment makes him a prostitute, and she is paying for night. Both are crimes in Georgia, so she could end up in prison. Most likely, no. Intim crimes are usually just fines anyway. Would you like me to prepare a petition in case you need it on Monday? Yes, please. Just email it to my work account, and I'll take a look at it over the weekend. I accepted. Accepted, and good luck this weekend. Maybe her head will fall back into place, not finding a better place, Elizabeth concluded. I went to my office. I don't really like to drink, and the thought of going to a bar, especially on a Friday afternoon, doesn't appeal to me. But the thought of returning home is even less attractive. I walked into an almost empty office. At first, I thought that even the secretary had left, but she ran out when she heard the bell ringing from the arriving guest. Mr. Thomas, um, are you feeling better? You, oh wow, maybe none of my business, but you look worse than you did this morning. Have you seen a doctor, Krista? Where is everyone? It looks like the office is closed. Well, Mr. Carlton announced that everyone has been working very hard the last few weeks, and someone, namely you, Mr. Thomas, has just closed a large deal for one of the firm's best clients. So, he said that by the end of the day, everyone can relax. I'll just clean up a little myself and then go home. That's nice of him. Krista, could you do one more thing before you leave? I would like a fresh cup of coffee, and this machine always puzzles me. With pleasure. I'll be back with a fresh cup. Now, Black, right? Yes, thanks a lot. A few minutes later, she returned to my office with a steaming cup. After a day of work, I needed something to cheer me up. I thanked her again, and she walked towards the exit but turned around to look at me. Mr. Thomas, I. Bobby? Krista, please call me Bobby. Um, okay, uh, Bobby. It sounds strange for me to call you that, but I think it suits you better than Mr. Thomas. So, Bobby, I know I'm just an administrator, but you should also know that I'm a kind person, and you look like you need kindness right now. If you need someone to talk to about what makes you look so terrible, I can be your advisor, listen, and not make any judgments about what is wrong with you. I looked at her for a long minute. 
She radiated such calmness from this woman whose last name I didn't even know. Krista, listen, I hate to say this, but I don't even know your last name. McDougal. I'm Krista McDougal. I understand these two surnames don't really suit each other, do they? My mom is German, and my dad, well, he was Irish. I was named after my mother's mother, who died during World War II. Okay, Krista McDougal. Why are you trying to be so nice to me? Other than drinking coffee and booking meeting rooms, we barely even spoke. Because you look so sad. I know you've been working really hard these last few months. You're always there and always nice to everyone, even when you must have been exhausted. So, I'm just trying to be nice to you when you look like you need it. Well, you're right. I'm sad and confused and angry. And do you really want to hear a very sad and, it seems to me, a very strange story? I hear you say that you really need to tell it, so yes, I want to hear it. So, I told my story again for the third time that day, and this time, I felt like I finally got catharsis from my story. When I finished, Krista, my new friend, burst out laughing. I joined her, and we probably sounded hysterical, or at least that's what I thought. Bobby, this is terrible, and the story is terribly strange. There must be something seriously wrong with your wife, she remarked. Yes, I think so too. But apart from preparing for the divorce, I don't know what else to do. Now I don't want to go home and listen to her idiocy, so I'm kind of stuck, I admitted. More thoughts on the other side of my desk, Bobby. I have an idea. Just an idea for now. Come home with me and have dinner with my daughter, mom, and me. I'll make great pasta, Bobby. It's Friday night, and I'm willing to bet big money that you won't cook anything special. How old is your daughter? Eleven. Do you all want to go to fast food? McDonald's maybe, or Chick-fil-A. Actually, Dana, my daughter, loves their chocolate milkshakes. She and I go and leave mom to watch TV. She records TV shows during the week and then watches them when Dana and I are not there. Okay, my new friend Krista. Let's take our cars, and I'll follow you home to your place, and then we'll head to Chick-fil-A. That's what we did. Being with Krista and Dana actually lifted my spirits. Dana had just finished elementary school and was heading to high school in the fall. She was proud of her excellent grades, as was Krista. It was calming for me to just sit and listen to their conversation between mother and daughter, relaxing and sad at the same time. Krista, of course, noticed this and did her best to involve me in the conversation. Bobby, how long have you been running? Everyone at the company knows that you run in the morning before coming to the office. How far do you run each week? Did you run track at USC? Well, yes, I ran at Yuga on the cross-country team in the fall and track and field in the spring. Truth be told, I wasn't good enough to run on an NCAA team, especially a Division I team like Georgia. But the coaches liked me. They liked my work ethic and let me run. I didn't even place in any of the races, but being on these teams was a great experience. I'm called a scholarship athlete, which doesn't mean much, but I get great seats at Georgia football games. Wait, wait, Mr. Bobby, did you go to Georgia, play on Georgia teams? and go to Georgia football games? I love Georgia. Mom says that I can go there if I study well because I will receive a Hope Scholarship, which will pay for everything. Dana, you're right. The Hope Scholarship is a wonderful thing. You just have to keep studying to qualify. I know, I know. Mom tells me this almost every day, Dana replied, said by an 11-year-old child, quite mature. How do I? It seemed and it's quite smart of her mom to push her to get good grades. We're still a little. We talked about school and Mac Beacon, our local minor league baseball team, and Krista frowned and talked about the upcoming concert in Atlanta. Apparently, there was some kind of promise to go there if a particular little girl got an A on her report card. Mom is fidgeting a little now. Well, ladies, I interrupted before the fidgeting and frowning intensified. I have to go. Thanks for including me in your dinner plans. The chicken was good, but the company was much, much better. You two have made my day so much better, and I thank you for that. Dana, it was nice meeting you. Krista McDougal, I'll see you on Monday. 
and I just want to say, I love your last name. Hope you both have a good weekend. As I was leaving, I heard Dana ask her mother, your last name? What is he talking about, mom? That made me chuckle. However, the grin disappeared when I returned home. Janet was waiting there, ready to nag me for not coming home at the appointed time. I got ahead of her, I said, entering the house. Janet, don't even start. I needed to be with myself. Unless you're ready to tell me you've cancelled your plans to cheat next week, I don't even want to be in the same room with you. Well, Bobby, I think I have some good news that you would have known about by now if you had come home at a decent hour. Okay, she was starting to dig herself in, but I was interested in hearing what good news she might have, so I asked her to continue. I talked to James today, I mean, I talked to the teacher, and I told him that you were very upset about the course next week. Tell me straight, that next week you will have intimate with another man, I chimed in with my own dig. God, Bobby, please. You have one opinion, and I have another. But I really love you, and I want to do what's best for us. So, the teacher and I came to a compromise. He keeps the deposit for himself, and I go to class on the first day. At the end of the day, he and I decide whether I will come to class again. If one of us, he or I, considers that additional lessons will not bring me any benefit, I will not pay him the remaining money and will not come for further lessons. Isn't that a compromise you can live with? Janet, I think this whole idea is just an excuse for you to have a night with another man and even pay for it. I know you don't agree, so I have an idea. Let's call your mom and ask what she thinks about your idea, huh? Bobby, you know your mom and dad. They believe that advanced algebra borders on sinful. Any kind of education is forbidden in the Bible about 40 times, at least that's how they read it. Then no, it does not make sense. How about another thing? We don't talk about this anymore until Monday evening, and I promise to tell you everything on Monday. If you think it's no use, if I haven't learned anything, if you promise to be truly objective and say I shouldn't go back there, then I won't. But you must promise to be objective. Agreed? I just shook my head and left, another night in the guest room and an early rise on Saturday morning for a long run. This time nice when it wasn't too hot yet and quite slow until I warmed up, then a few quick bursts in a row. Not my student days, but not bad for a 40-year-old lawyer. I came back into the house to take a shower. Janet still hadn't gotten up, so I left the house. Not to the office. I'd seen enough of this place lately. Without any plans, without intention, without, ah, uh, hell, of course, I intended to do this. I parked in front of Krista's house and rang the doorbell. I'll open it now, I heard Krista's voice from inside. The door opened, and there she stood, her face covered in grease stains, her hair pulled back under a white cap. Her hands wearing strange-looking gloves, and yet she looked absolutely beautiful. What the hell? I was cleaning the oven. You can't, Mom, come here quickly. She ran somewhere back into the house as I stood there, realizing that I had made a huge mistake. An elderly woman appeared. I'm Mrs. McDougal, the woman said, and you must be Bobby. Come in and sit down. You did something down there in Georgia, and my granddaughter thinks you could walk on water. My daughter probably thought the same thing last night, but now you're coming here when she's not ready yet. Woohoo, big mistake, mister. You're right, Mrs. McDougal. I feel very stupid. Can't I just tell her I'm sorry and that I'll call her later or maybe just see her on Monday? No, sir. You messed up. Now stay and clean it up. She ran off to get herself in order, and you were polite enough to wait for her. Give her the right compliments and explain yourself. That you are sorry. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. You're right. I'll wait for her. Is Dana here? While I waited, I could talk to her. No, Dana is playing football, and Krista should pick her up in about an hour. Okay, I'll just sit quietly, she said as she left. I felt like an absolute idiot and wanted to sneak away and never look at Krista again, but then she came back into the living room, and I was glad I stayed. Her headdress and gloves were gone, she had time to wash her face and even put on her makeup. It seemed, and it's quite smart of her mom to push her to get good grades. Put on lipstick and change clothes. Of course, she looked great. 
she had been working at Bingham Car and Quick for at least a year without me even noticing. Maybe I just never looked at it. My mistake, Bobby. Krista, wait, please. Let me tell you how sorry I am for bursting in without calling. I feel very stupid for my idiocy and especially for confusing you. You should know I met your mom, and she scolded me a little, and I deserved it all. Yeah, she's pretty good at that. I don't know why you're here, and I felt pretty awkward when I opened the door. I started to interrupt, but she continued, Wait, Bobby, let me finish. This morning, Dana is playing football. How about we go to the football field together? We can watch her play, and you can tell us why you came this morning. Um, okay? It's okay. And again, I'm sorry for putting you in an awkward position. It was terribly rude of me. Yes, it was. But now, let's leave it in the past and go watch football. And so we did. We went to see Dana play, pretty good but not great. During the game, Krista and I had time to talk, well, I did most of the talking. And she made sympathetic sounds after listening to me croak and whine about Janet for a while. And the game was already ending. Krista interrupted my monologue, Bobby, you need to fish or take off the bait. You understand what this means, right? I shrugged slightly, and she tried another aphorism. You need to do something or go out from the toilet. God, Bobby, you either have to accept what she says she's going to do, which I know you don't want, or tell her in your sternest, angriest voice that if she goes through with it, you will absolutely file for divorce next week. And you have to make her believe it. That's how our conversation ended. Dana came running with the joyful glow of an 11-year-old child who had won the game. I offered to invite them to lunch, but Krista quickly declined. Work from home for both of them, she said. I dropped them off at their townhouse and headed to, where else, the office. I couldn't face Janet. I'd already run out that day. I didn't want to call my friends, which would lead to awkward questions, and I didn't want to go to the bar. So I sat in my office and thought. A draft divorce petition arrived from Elizabeth by email. I looked it over, sent her a few nagging comments, and finally went home. Janet was preparing dinner when I walked in. She said hello and didn't talk about the elephant in the room, and neither did I. We had dinner together, talked politely about the weather and the school year in general, meaningless chatter. I cleaned up after dinner as she had prepared everything. When I finished, she was watching something on TV. I ignored her and headed to my office. Bobby, would you like to watch a movie on TV with me? No, Janet. We have a huge elephant in the room, and until we solve it, I'm not very comfortable sitting next to you. Next week, we will make a decision either you stop your plan to cheat, or if you go through with it, I will file for divorce. I went further to my office. Later, I went to bed again in the guest room. I didn't sleep very well, but that didn't surprise me. The next day, Sunday, I went to exercise and then had breakfast alone, not bothering Krista or wanting to see my wife that day. Luckily, me and Bacon were playing at home that day, so I went to their game. They lost, but I had a good time immersing myself in the atmosphere of the game for a while. Eventually, the game ended, and I slowly, reluctantly headed home. I thought about staying in a motel, but I wanted to give Janet one last chance to save our marriage. No dinner together. I don't know if she ate at all. Finally, I made a sandwich and sat in my office until I was so tired that I went to bed. As I headed to the spare bedroom, Janet came up to me. Bobby, I just want you to know that tomorrow everything will be over. When you get home from work, we can sit down and talk. And you, not me, but you can decide whether I should come back for more instructions on Wednesday. Janet, we're just going in circles. Tomorrow, you will cheat on me, and for some reason, you don't see it. Your cheating will end our marriage, and you just don't see that, either. Bobby, no. I promise you'll see tomorrow. Everything will be better. Crazy. Well, is she really mentally ill, or did she just go crazy because of some other man? Or amazed by real lustful cockroaches? Who the hell knows? I felt like she was driving me crazy. I didn't answer and went to bed. Monday began with a phone call to Elizabeth to ensure that Janet would be followed by a private investigator if she attended the instruction. 
I went to work but didn't expect to be able to do anything real. I sat at my desk, literally staring at my phone, waiting for a call from a private investigator. Just before noon, the phone did ring, but it was from Elizabeth, the divorce lawyer, not the private investigator. Bobby, a private investigator, called me a few minutes ago and said that he followed your wife to a house on Laramie Drive. She entered the house about an hour ago and still hasn't come out. This private investigator is also an employee of the court and will be able to serve her divorce papers in this house if you want me to tell him to do so. Elizabeth, thank you for your message. I simply have no choice. Please let him deliver the documents. Can a private investigator record this delivery? Well, I mean, I'd like to see her reaction if possible. I'm sure the private investigator has a video camera. I'll tell him to record it all, and I'll email it to you later today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me know when I owe you more for your fee or the private investigator's fee. Don't worry, take care of yourself now. Later that day, the video did arrive, attached to the email. Watching it on my laptop, I felt only sadness, no anger, but no tears either. The camera must have been attached to the private investigator's chest pocket. It all started when he knocked on the door. Finally, the door was opened by a tall, handsome, fit guy dressed in a robe and looking disheveled. What's the matter? The guy shouted to the private investigator. I need to talk to Mrs. Janet Thomas, he replied. What? There's no one here with that name. Listen carefully, answered the private detective. I am a sworn officer of the Superior Court of Mon Bibb County, and I know that Mrs. Thomas is in this house. Inform her that she must appear before me or suffer the consequences. Wow, I thought. I have to admire him. Everything he says is absolutely true and completely meaningless, but the idiot who answered the door obviously doesn't know that. Okay, okay, wait a minute. I'll try to find her. He disappeared from the camera's view and returned to the house. Then, to my eternal sadness, Janet appeared at the door, also in a dressing gown and also disheveled. I'm Janet Thomas. Why are you looking for me? She said. Ma'am, can I see your documents? Asked the private detective. Wait a minute. She disappeared into the house and reappeared a few minutes later. Here's my driver's license. Now tell me who you are and why you need me. The private investigator held the driver's license up to the camera and then handed it back along with a folder of documents. Janet Thomas. You have been served with a petition for divorce and accompanying documents. You are advised to consult with an attorney of your choice. Janet collapsed to the floor. The video stayed on long enough to focus on her lying on the floor, and then it went dark. I must have passed out too because I didn't move until I finally looked up and saw Krista standing in front of my desk. Bobby, she did it, didn't she? Oh, you poor dear. Want, oh, I don't know. I don't even know what to tell you. You can come to my house for dinner if you want. My mom cooked something, so it must be delicious. I know Dana will be glad to see you. Thank you, Krista, but I won't be good company for anyone. But can I use the invitation later? Of course, you can. You can come anytime. Just don't forget to call first, the last part was said with a tiny grin. In response, I also grinned. Thank you. Krista. I really mean it. See you tomorrow. Fine, she left, and I was left sitting there, feeling sorry for myself and even, believe it or not, feeling sorry for Janet. Whatever she wanted to get out of her education, I knew it wouldn't be a divorce petition. I ended up going to a nearby hotel to spend the night. Janet called me on my cell phone several times, but I didn't answer and turned off the phone. Long night, little sleep, or run the next morning that didn't help me at all. This is how my life went for the next few weeks. I returned to the house, making sure Janet had gone to get some clothes and other things I needed. I found myself an apartment, quite nice and close to work. I didn't talk to Janet at all, didn't even see her until our divorce hearing. Elizabeth and I sat at one table, Janet and her lawyer, the young guy Elizabeth greeted, sat at another. I looked around the courtroom and noticed the man with the video. Elizabeth pointed to him. She shrugged and told me not to worry. I am not a trial lawyer, so being in court is a rarity for me. The bailiff called for everyone to stand. We stood, 
and the judge walked in, an older woman in a black robe, already going through papers as she sat down at her elevated desk. Lawyers Thomas vs. Thomas, are you both ready to get started? She asked. They both answered in the affirmative, and she continued, Miss Jenkins, as the plaintiff's lawyer, you speak first. And I remind both lawyers, no theatrics. There's no jury here, so showing off won't help you and could get you in trouble. Clear? They both said yes again, and the judge nodded to Elizabeth. Your Honor, this is a direct claim for divorce based on Mrs. Thomas's adultery. Mr. Thomas, my client, is not asking or offering any alimony. There are no children, the marital home is rented, savings will be split 50 50ths, and both parties will keep their retirement accounts. Everything is as stated in the statement of claim. She sat down, thank you, lawyer. Delightfully brief. I always appreciate this. Mr. Graham, as counsel for the defendant, do you have an answer? Yes, your honor. My client denies the charge of adultery, and we are prepared to present evidence that no adultery occurred, neither in the form and place alleged in the plaintiff's statement nor at any other time. What is your evidence? asked the judge. With your permission, your honor, I would like to call a witness. Of course, it should be interesting. Your Honor, I call James Power to testify. Of course, the guy with the video stood up and approached the dock. He was sworn in and sat in the witness chair. Janet's lawyer tried to portray him as an intimate education expert. Mr. Power, please tell the court about your relationship with Mrs. Janet Thomas. I was hired by Mrs. Thomas for educational purposes to conduct a short-term course in techniques to improve her and her husband's responses to each other. Do you have the right to teach education courses? Yes, by the California Board of Intim Education, from which I have a diploma. And do you charge for these courses? Yes, my standard fee is $1,000 for a three-day course. In Mrs. Thomas's case, she told me that her husband objected to the course, so I adjusted the curriculum to start with only one day of instruction for her $500 deposit. Did this one day of training include intimate contact? No, ma'am, Mrs. Thomas received the divorce petition before we even got to the actual intercourse. She was so upset by the divorce filing that we no longer met for additional training. Thank you, Mr. Power, I have no more questions. The judge turned to Elizabeth, Counselor, do you have any questions for this witness? Yes, Your Honor, several. Getting up, Elizabeth whispered to me, you might like it. Addressing the witness, she continued, Mr. Stringowitz, can I call you that since that's your real name, right? Ah, uh, well, my name is Power, which is Stangowitz, which is the name I had when I was born, but I don't use it anymore. Did you stop using it because that name is on your arrest report? I object, Your Honor. Janet's lawyer jumped up and began to speak further, but the judge raised her hand. Miss Jenkins, I am inclined to agree with Mr. Graham. How might this be relevant? Your Honor. This is relevant in two respects. First, as you know, a criminal conviction affects the reliability of a witness's testimony. Second, Mr. Stringowitz's criminal conviction stems from an adultery charge. You can continue, but you should know that I doubt the appropriateness of this. Yes, ma'am, thank you. So, Mr. Stringowitz, please tell the court how many times and for what offenses you have been convicted, specifically in the state of California. Ah, uh, ah, uh, he looked at Janet's lawyer for help but was left alone. Well, ah, uh, it was, ah, uh, well, ah, uh, an accusation of receiving money for night, he finally whispered, as if that would help. Mr. Stringowitz, receiving money for intim in the state of California? Well, yes, but. And how many times have you been convicted, either pleading guilty or being found guilty, of pimping or similar charges of receiving money for night? Do you agree that this number is at least 24? Your Honor, the plaintiff's lawyer is nudging the witness, I objected. Mr. Graham, as you know, well, as you should know, the plaintiff's lawyer is cross-examining your witness and has the right to ask leading questions. Carry on, Miss Jenkins, thank you, Your Honor. So, Mr. Stringowitz, there are at least 24 convictions for money, is this right? Well, some of them were just. Please. Mr. Stringowitz, yes or no? Okay, then, yes, thank you. As for your certificate from the Council on Intim Education, 
How many hours of classroom training did you attend to obtain it? Well, there weren't really any activities in class, you see. I earned my degree mostly through practice. Do you mean on-the-job training? So, did you have intimate with students or potential students? Yes, that's how they learn, you know. Certainly, moving on to your meeting with Mrs. Thomas, did you pre-qualify her for your education course? Yes, I did. It's standard procedure. And what methods did you use for this preliminary selection? Well, in simple terms, it was non-penetrative intim so that I could gauge her level of experience and how comfortable she felt with these acts. Thank you, Mr. Stringowitz. I hope you will allow me to briefly summarize Mr. Stringowitz's testimony. I think this will be helpful for both my client and the defendant. Go ahead, Miss Jenkins, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Thomas, Elizabeth said, turning to Janet and Mrs. Thomas, in his testimony, Mr. Stringowitz admits that he is a convicted man on charges of receiving money for night. With a meaningless diploma, to whom Mrs. Thomas paid $500 for a night under the guise of education. Unfortunately for Mrs. Thomas, despite the disguise. Intim for money in Georgia is still a crime for which Mr. Stringowitz can be arrested as the performer and Mrs. Thomas as his client. Adultery in Georgia does not have to involve what is called penetrative experience. In Georgia's definition of adultery, intimate as Mr. Stringowitz described it certainly counts as intim. Therefore, I am afraid that Mrs. Thomas is, in fact, guilty of adultery. Your Honor, I have no further questions for this witness. Miss Jenkins, you have skillfully stated your position. Mr. Graham, do you have an answer for the accused? Your Honor, may we take a short break to consider Miss Jenkins' arguments? The judge actually called a break, and the hearing dragged on for some time, but Elizabeth clearly won. She later told me that it was quite easy to get information about Stringowitz. He got kicked out of California for running his scams on too many stupid women, especially married ones. Janet was one of many. Speaking of Janet, as we left the courtroom, I heard her complain to her lawyer, but I didn't even have a night with that guy. The divorce was granted on essentially the same terms that Elizabeth presented to the judge. Janet was never arrested for her role in the relationship with Stringowitz, but he was accused of receiving money for night and given the choice of leaving Georgia immediately or spending 90 days in the county jail. Of course, he decided to leave, probably hoping to find a better place for his scam. I later learned that he made the mistake of driving through the small town where Janet's family lived. I didn't hear whether he managed to get out of the city. Krista and I dated, tried to start a serious relationship, but nothing worked out. I liked her mom and little daughter better than Krista, and I think she was able to understand that. But we became friends, and we still remain so. I got my big bonus and became a partner, but then John Thompson, a shopping center client of mine in Nashville, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He was sufficiently impressed with my work on his project in Monon that he offered me a full-time position at his headquarters in Nashville with equity in his new projects. More risk than staying at a law firm, but as it turns out, much more reward. About a year after the divorce, I heard from Janet's mom. She got my number in Nashville from my old law firm and called to tell me Janet had died. After her divorce, she returned to southern Georgia and lived with her parents. She started having headaches, and when she went to the doctor, she was diagnosed with a huge brain tumor. A few weeks later, she died. A few months after I learned of Janet's death, I was in Tallahassee, Florida, exploring a potential location for a shopping center. I decided to stop by her family's small town and pay my respects at her grave. There, I found a tombstone. It looked like it had just been installed. On it were the dates of her birth and death, as well as the inscription, Janet Thomas, beloved daughter and loving wife. This made me retreat. I stood there, lost, remembering my time with Janet, so many good times and such a terrible ending. Could her madness be caused by a brain tumor? I think so, because brain tumors exist, but lustful cockroaches? No. I was ready to accept the inscription on the grave. After all, it had been true for almost our entire life together. I felt better. I began to feel better about myself and my future. What do you think of today's story? Was the wife's action right or wrong? Write your opinion in the comments. 
See you in the next video.